Okay. Okay, welcome. Uh, welcome to the next uh, Tuesday seminar at the University of Warsaw Astronomical Observatory. And today um, we have a speaker from the US, um, Katie Van Doru, um, who is uh, a fellow at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and the University of Maryland. Um, Katie uh, is originally from Greece, but she studied in uh, the UK, Australia, and then did her PhD in Tasmania. And she's working on microlensing on planets, uh, and she's going to tell us about how to measure masses of events uh, with Keck. Katie. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, as Wukash said, my name is Katie Vandoru. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Wukash for inviting me to give this talk. Um, of course, I'd much rather be there in person. Um, although I heard that it just uh, snowed a lot and it's very, very cold there. So maybe it was a wise decision not to come. Um, so yeah, I'm a postdoc at NASA Goddard and the University of Maryland. I've been here for a year so far working on measuring the masses of microlensing events with Keck amongst some other projects. Um, but this is my main field, uh, which is also an extension of my PhD. And of course, it's what I'll be talking about today. Ultimately, in this talk, I want to show you how we measure the masses of microlensing events with Keck and talk about events that I've specifically worked on, and more importantly, why we should bother with follow-ups in general. Um, but none of that will make much sense if I don't tell you a little bit about gravitational microlensing first. Uh, and I'm going to do this by pretending that none of you in the audience already have successful careers on this topic already. So while I have your attention, let's jump right into some microlensing. Of course, I can't begin an introduction on microlensing without mentioning this man here. Uh, I think most people kind of know the story where he eventually published his theory, what he called a little calculation after being um, asked to by a colleague. Uh, and in his paper, he mentions that there's no hope of uh, observing this phenomenon. Of course, astronomers persisted, and soon there was progress made. Um, but it wasn't until Paczynski that microlensing really took off back in the 1980s with the search of machos in the galactic halo. And of course, Paczynski was educated um, at the University of Warsaw. And after his early work, um, Microlensing really took off in earnest. Collaborations were set up like Ogle, MOA, came TNET. Um, and now we have detected and are still detecting so many microlensing events per year to the point that uh, people are starting to look into machine learning because we just don't have the capability to analyze so many light curves manually per year. So going back to what microlensing is, well, it's a tool that can be used to detect objects that we can't see. There are lots of stars in the sky in our galaxy that are all moving with their own proper motions. And if we look towards the galactic bulge, even with the naked eye on a good night, we can see that this is really dense region of stars. And because of this, it's where microlensing has mostly taken place so far. Now imagine as you look towards this dense stellar region that a star, um, a lens, passes in front of another star, a background source. The gravitational field around the lens will amplify the light of the background star over time. And if this lens star has a companion, then the companion's gravitational field will also amplify the background source, source's light. And if this alignment is directly in the line of sight of the Earth, then we can observe this microlensing event, um, which then means we can make a plot of amplification against time and get a light curve. Of course, the companion doesn't have to be a planet. It could be another star or the lens might not have a companion at all. A lot of microlensing so far has focused on exoplanet detections and it has contributed a lot to the field of exoplanet science. But since we're not 
so, sorry, since we are detecting, uh, since what we are detecting is the light from the background source being amplified by the lens system's gravity, the lens system can be anything. It could be a main sequence star, it could be an M dwarf, it could also be a white dwarf, a neutron star, a stellar black hole, um, it could be a rogue planet even. All it needs is mass and well, essentially to be in the right place at the right time. So here's another more serious plot with no smiley stars, um, but it's showing the same thing. Light from a background source is being amplified by a lensing system over time. And in the left figure, you can see how the ideal light curve of a lens system would look like compared to a binary system. Of course, light curves all look totally different. And it's these differences that give us clues as to what the lensing system is made up of. So now you know some very basic microlensing. Uh, it can detect dark or faint objects because it doesn't rely on their light. And we mostly observe towards the galactic bulge because there is a higher chance of us observing this chance alignment. From a microlensing event, we get a light curve model. Um, there are lots of different types of light curve model, light curves with the key being finding like, what model is the best fit. Um, but sometimes there are degeneracies, which means the same data can be explained by many different models. And I don't think this is that uncommon, especially if there are systematic errors in your photometric data, or if they're just isn't a lot of data on the event, so your whole light curve, you don't have data points on your whole light curve. This is an example, um, which I'll, I'll also talk about more later on. So they tested multiple models and found that two models were both just as likely. So for cases like this, we need to do some additional, uh, some additional digging to see what is going on. So the microlensing model does not directly give you the mass of the individual components that make up the system. It gives you a bunch of other parameters, and these are some of the model parameters um, that I've listed on the slide. Uh, some models also have a microlensing parallax, parallax effect, either from the orbital motion of the Earth or using simultaneous observations from a space telescope. So there's uh, a lot of technical language on this slide. And so these are things you'll see in every microlensing paper, but if you're not a microlenser, just remember what the Einstein angular ring radius is. And that's all you really need to take away. So we would like to get from these models and parameters to some sort of mass estimate because astronomers really like to know the masses of things. Um, and microlensing by itself is not always great at mass measurements unless, um, unless there are two second order effects present on the light curve, or you can also find a mass by getting additional data after the microlensing event has ended. So starting with these second order effects, they are due to either the source radius or due to parallax effects. Finite source effects due to the source radius are often seen as spikes on the light curve. And from them, you can get a measurement of the Einstein ring radius. Finite source effects are present on almost every planetary light curve, but parallax is less common to see. Why? Because we would need an event to last a long time, several weeks or months, so that the Earth's orbit can be significant or you need to secure time on a space telescope. We have, uh, we have two relations, two unknowns, the lens mass and distance. If we, have both, if we have both of these effects in place, parallax and finite source effects, then we can calculate these parameters. If you have one without the other, you can still get a rough estimate or upper and lower limits, um, it just won't be very well constrained. 
follow up observations are observations that happen after the microlensing event has taken place and uh, it has several advantages. So you can wait, you can wait several years for the source and lens to no longer be in that perfect alignment with us on Earth, which means we can resolve the two stars, we can see the two stars individually. Then we can measure their separation and therefore relative proper motion, which we can then use to recalculate and reconstrain the Einstein ring radius, which if you remember from the previous slide is essential for one of the mass distance relations. The other advantage of follow-ups and resolving the lens star is of course, you can then directly measure its flux, in, in which case we can use empirical mass luminosity relations to constrain the mass of the lens. So this image here is one, I think the, the best visual published example of a resolved system. The separation was over 70 milli arc seconds. The conditions on the mountain at uh, in Hawaii and the Keck telescope were perfect. They were really, really good that night. And I was there actually with our, observing with our team in 2019. Um, I remember very clearly when the first images came up and we could very clearly see the lens. And yes, everyone was very happy at three o'clock in the morning. Okay, so here are some pictures from our 2019 observing run. So hopefully that's refreshed everyone on microlensing. Um, I heard your seminar last week was on some microlensing theory, so you should all be experts by now, I think. Um, but the main takeaway point from this little introduction, there are certain conditions that need to be met if you want to measure the mass and distance of the microlensing system. These uh, are sometimes not met and need, or they need some refining, they need confirming, and we can do this with high resolution follow-up observations. Okay, so time to move into the Keck follow-up segment of this talk. Um, and I'll talk about the follow-up work I have been doing. So yeah, before I get into my work, follow-up data needs to be from a telescope capable of high angular resolution. We have primarily used the Keck telescopes and Hubble. Uh, SuperVru has also been used in the past. And in the future, Roman will be capable of also conducting follow-ups. Um, and with Roman, we will have a lot more data. So at the moment, our research process is also finding which, te which techniques work best and how can we automate our pipelines as much as possible and make everything user-friendly. This is the team that I work with on follow-up observations and data, uh, kind of, yeah, all spread around the globe with JP split between Tasmania and Paris. Um, and Tasmania, as Wukash said, being where I got my PhD from. So moving on to some technical information about our actual observations. Uh, we do them in the near infrared in Keck's K, H and J bands. However, in more recent years, we've only observed with K because this has just been the best for our targets. It gives us the best quality data. We've also used some H band data. Um, we found J band to be the least useful. Um, we use the wide camera on Keck initially for our calibration because we need to have enough stars in the field that will match up with a catalog. Then we use the narrow camera to actually try and resolve the lens. In most cases, we use a laser guide star to track our target because um, this just helps with accuracy. And we've used both Keck 1 or Keck 2. It doesn't really make a huge difference to us. And on average, we take exposures of 30 seconds, 10 to 30 frames per event. And our limit in K-band is about 21 magnitudes if conditions are really, really good. 
all the raw data is publicly available on the COA website. So our pipeline consists of getting raw images from CAT, of course, um, which we then have to process in this way that I've written on the slide. We use a code called CHI, which can be found on GitHub. Uh, it primarily uses Python, but it does use some other software too. So it can be a little bit annoying to install on certain machines but this will do everything in terms of image processing. And once you get it running, it's really, really good. A simpler version of Kai also exists, which, which is written by Joshua Blackman and I, um, but it doesn't take weather into account. It still works perfectly well, but Kai is definitely a lot more sophisticated. Next, we use the VVV catalog to cross identify stars in our image and we calibrate magnitudes. Um, then of course we come down to actually trying to identify the lens. In some cases, this can be done by eye, or you might just see some elongation where your target star is. In which case um, you need to use a PSF fitting tool like Deofot or whatever your preference is. Once the lens has been identified, we can then get its flux. We can get the relative proper motion between the source and the lens. Um, and then, as I've mentioned before, we can get all these different relations that let us measure and constrain the mass. So now for some, uh, some real examples that I have been working on, this is follow-up work I've been doing at the moment. Um, our team is mostly focused on planetary microlensing events. Um, so yeah, trying to find and find the mass of exoplanets, but this whole process can definitely be expanded and adapted to other lensing systems. Um, I presented this event at the most recent microlensing conference in Paris, and it's finally submitted. And soon I will put it up on archive as well. Um, so I apologize if you've already spent 15 minutes of your life listening to me talk about this event, but you'll have to uh, listen again, I guess. So here is the follow-up Keck data, the final image, and then the zoom of the target area shown in the four different panels. First of all, I had to get rid of this nearby star as it was causing me problems. Then I built a PSF model using a selection of single stars in the field. So basically telling Deofot what a star in this image looks like. Then we generate a difference image by subtracting this PSF model that I've just created. Um, and at this point, we're assuming that our target is just one star. And uh, which, but in the difference image in panel C, we see a residual, this bright little spot, um, which could mean that there's another star hiding in the wings. And of course, we think that it might be the lens. So then we generate another difference image, but this time assuming there are two stars there and we get flat residuals which is good because it means we've just confirmed that this residual is actually a star. Um, this process, of course, is usually repeated over and over again with slightly different variations, just to make sure that what we, see, what we are seeing isn't just some anomaly. So here the separation is 55 milli arc seconds and we find that the source is 15 times brighter than the lens. This is just another perspective. Um, the position, you can see the positions of the lens and source star and the best fit MCMC contours. Um, and this is using the same brightness gradient. So you can see that the lens is much, much fainter than the source star. So we really do need to use a PSF fitting tool to actually be able to um, resolve it because we wouldn't be able to do it with just looking at the image.
Uh, things are always explained better in plots rather than equations, I think. Um, so this figure plots all the different relations we have for this event using the new follow-up data while also sharing what the other papers have found. As I mentioned, our work on this event was with follow-up Keck data. The discovery paper is by Bond et al. in blue. And then another team led by Schwarzwald et al. also published their detection of the event with additional Spitzer data with which they measured a parallax. From our Keck data, we see that the lens system has an M dwarf host with a sub-Neptune companion that uh, is about 10 times the mass of the Earth. And we find this by using these two relations, uh, the empirical mass luminos luminosity relation, which incorporates the Keck lens, flu Keck lens flux as a constraint, and a mass distance relation, which is constrained from the proper motion that we find. And although this agrees with the discovery paper by Bond, it very much does not agree with Schwarzwald's analysis, uh, which used the finite source effects plus parallax from Spitzer to measure the mass of the system. As mentioned before, if you have these two effects on the light curve, you can get very tight constraints on the mass and distance of the system, but parallax uh, so is sometimes not reliable. So, and in this case, we had to investigate why there was this huge difference between re the results. So this is the light curve using KMT net data. And in red, you can see the Spitzer light curve. By subtracting the two light curves from each other, they managed to measure uh, microlensing parallax. So we did a couple of things. Um, we reanalyzed the Spitzer data and could not replicate their parallax. And in fact, we found that the signal to noise was too low for any definitive result. Um, so yeah, we just couldn't replicate their result at all. Another factor which makes their parallax measurement a little suspicious is that it infers a counter-rotating lens in the disc. So a lens star in the disc rotating opposite, in the opposite direction to the rest of the stellar population in the galactic disc. Um, and in this figure, you can see the two dimensional parallax distribution of the lens. The blue cross indicates the value obtained from this work. So what we would have gotten from the proper motion of the star. And the gray crosses are the values presented in Schwarzwald using the Spitzer data set. Um, so you can see that there, there's a very low probability of, um, of this star being a counter-rotating lens. So that's the story of 1195. The Keck follow-up data ruled out the possibility of its being an ultra-cold dwarf with an Earth mass companion. It's a bit of a doom and gloom paper about how parallaxes can, can't can always be trusted and high resolution follow-ups are needed, et cetera. But the message of this paper is that low signal to noise, low cadence photometric data can give suspicious parallaxes. But this has only been tested so far for 1195. Um, so it would be interesting to see if all low cadence data with Spitzer um, can lead to parallaxes that uh, might be misleading. Uh, there are events with parallax measurements that have been absolutely spot on and then confirmed with additional Keck constraints like this example by Joshua Blackman. And there are also more examples um, that we are seeing that we haven't published yet. Um, so parallaxes are good. In general. This is um, another event that I'm working on. It's quite close to being done, but it also feels miles away from being done. Um, so I showed the light curve for this event like 20 minutes ago in the introduction. In this paper, 
in the detection paper, they found that two models could explain what's going on, one with parallax and one with something called Zellerap, which is the parallax effect due to the orbital motion of the source star. So it's kind of an inverse of parallax. But their conclusion, um, their final conclusion was the one with parallax, although they did not rule out the Zellerap solution, suggesting that follow-up data be acquired, uh, which we did in both Keck and um, HST. Uh, I'm still in the process of analyzing the HST data, and uh, we also want to rerun the microlensing model with some improvements that have been done since 2010. Uh, but so far, our Keck, our Keck data seems to agree with the Zellerat model, which you can see in the green cross. So when we talk about the theta E constraint, the Einstein angular ring radius, from our Keck results, what we mean is that we calculate it using proper motion, like you can see in this equation in red. But it can also be found a different way. And that's using this equation in yellow. Uh, and this uses parameters from the parallax model or from the microlensing model in general. Um, so we've I've made a plot here of what the Einstein ring radius would be if you just measured it from the parallax model. Um, so you can see it does not agree with what we find. And then I use the Einstein ring radius from the Zellerap model. And it looks like our results, uh, yeah, again, do agree better with the Zellerup model. Of course, we have HST images to analyze as well. Um, so hopefully, yeah, we'll see what, what comes out of that. But at the moment, it looks like it's a main sequence star and with a mass of about 0 0.6 solar masses, this would mean that the planet uh, is almost exactly one Saturn mass. So let's have a look at the lens, uh, the host star for this event. Following the same process as 1195, we found a separation of 33 milli arc seconds and the source is nine times brighter. So this is a very small separation and we're almost at our limit with Keck. Um, conditions have to be very good for us to see a separation and be able to resolve a separation like this. So um, it's really good to also have HST data because HST has better resolving, uh, higher resolution um, since it's in space. Okay, so those were the events that I've currently, the FIT just finished and I'm working on at the moment in terms of follow-up research. Um, hopefully everyone understands a little bit more about how we conduct our follow-up observations. Um, besides these two events, my colleagues are of course working on lots of other events. At the moment, it can be a fairly slow process, but it's picking up momentum. So we have a lot of Keck data, um, but not a lot of people working on them. And a lot of the code and the pipeline that we're using now has only been developed and completed in the last couple of years. Um, so the way that I see it, there are two main reasons for our research at the moment, which brings me to the why segment of this talk. And as I was writing this talk, I realized that the why bit also includes, it, in, includes the Roman segment. Um, so this will be the last um, bit of my talk. So the first part is we want to know the mass of the host star and its companion, and we want to know it accurately. And with microlensing, you can do this, uh, you, you can do this without follow-up observations if you have finite source effects and a good parallax measurement. But this is not the case for a lot of events. Um, so we need follow-up observations and we really care about mass for a lot of reasons. For me personally, I just like to know what kind of system I'm looking at 
And I just find that in itself quite exciting. But for the wider community, knowing the masses, the distance, it all goes towards models that help us understand planetary formation theories, stellar evolution theories, demographics for different types of populations. And microlensing can probe a parameter space that we don't know much about. So I think we've maybe all seen this plot before, a planet's mass as a function of its orbital radius, um, but the planets of the solar system as well. In microlensing and exoplanets in general, we talk a lot about something called the snow line and how microlensing is really good at finding planets beyond the snow line of that particular system. And this is important to exoplanet sites because it's where we think that planets form. Um, now, I didn't talk about the snow line much before with my events, even though they are both cold planets, because I wanted to focus more on the mass measurement method using Keck. Um, but all these things are interconnected. Here's another slightly different version of that plot. Um, so now we're looking at a planet's mass as a function of its distance from the snow line. So these are all the exoplanets found to date, I think. Um, so zero AU means that the planet is exactly in the position of the predicted snow line for that individual system. And interestingly enough, almost all the planets microlensing has found uh, looks like they're likely located beyond the snow line, which is very cool. But of course, to generate these kinds of plots and to understand these demographics, um, we need to know their physical parameters, mass, distance, and so on. So follow-up observations are important um, for this exact reason, because they can help measure the mass and distance of systems. In addition, people in the MOA collaboration have been studying the cold planet distribution um, as compared to the distribution predicted by planet formation models. Um, so they use about 30 planetary systems, but this distribution so far is only based off the mass ratio. Um, and they are currently updating this slowly with actual masses that we have been measuring with follow-up data. So a big part of our follow-up research and proposal writing is focused on this cold planet distribution plot and getting accurate masses for these planets. Um, Roman is going to be doing a lot of things, uh, one of them being detecting microlensing events, as we, as we all know. And a lot of people are already contributing to Roman science and how this mission can be supported. Uh, one of the things that Roman will be capable of eventually doing is follow up observations of microlensing events. And uh, hopefully there's gonna be a lot of amazing data. And all this data, of course, needs, uh, needs to be analyzed. So a big part of our research that our team is doing is how do we streamline our process? How do we make everything user-friendly, automate as much as, as much as we can without sacrificing the integrity of our results? Um, yeah, putting our code on GitHub and making sure that it's open source and getting feedback from um, potential users. So in summary, um, microlensing is a great unique method for detecting dark objects like planets, but it has some limitations when it comes to mass measurements, which can all be overcome with follow-up observations by Keck or HST or other high angular resolution telescopes. Um, this has already been done for quite a few planetary events. Um, but our methods can be applied to confirm um, other kinds, other kinds of microlensed systems as well. 
Thank you for listening. Here is my email again. Uh, if anyone wants to discuss things further or collaborate or just go climbing, um, please don't hesitate to reach out and uh, I'll take questions now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. Questions? Thank you. Maybe from the audience here. Anyone? There is a question from Maya on Zoom. Maya, please. Yes, hello. Uh, yes, I, I was aware about your research uh, because I was in Paris, but uh, I have a question. Uh, well, because the uh, CAC observations are really uh, powerful, but uh, what is generally the time scale uh, you think it's reasonable to wait after an event to make some mm -hmm. reasonable uh, follow-up observation with CAC? Um, so that really, it depends for each event. Um, so usually we can, we can get a predicted relative proper motion, like a rough proper motion. Um, so for example, if your relative proper motion is five milli arc seconds per year, then you might have to wait 10 years to be able to see something, um, sometimes less, sometimes more. Um, like as you saw, the two events that I'm working on, um, MOA 2010, BLG 328, we, um, our follow-up observations were taken, um, when were they taken? 2018, so eight years after the microlensing event took place, but with Ogle 2016, the proper motion was very high. So we only had to wait um, four years in order to be able to resolve the lens. So yeah, it could be a few years, it could be a decade. So it's very variable. Yes, I see. Uh, yes, I was just interested in the general time scale because I'm mm -hmm. not really an expert at uh, imaging like like CAC. So thank you very yeah. much. Uh, it was Sorry. a great talk and great research. Thank you. Thank you. Well, so that was actually almost my also my question. Uh, but to follow on this, um, so you managed to resolve some things even after just three years of time, right? So is mm -hmm. there a selection bias? Uh, in the events you decide to follow, uh, you only you first you select those where you have any clue about proper motion, or because sometimes you have you know it better, sometimes you don't know it at all, right? It depends mm -hmm. on the event. Uh, yeah. So your selection criteria relies on this. Is that the primary uh, criterion? Yeah. So, um, so part of it is looking at. Yeah, what, what is the predicted proper motion? And then there are certain targets that are, I guess, higher priority. Uh, for example, um, targets that are part of this cold planet distribution. Um, so this was part of this nine year MOA sample. So nine years, nine years had already, part, already passed for a lot of those events. Um, and this was, I mean, this was like sl slightly before I got into microlensing. So David Bennett was making the selection, but I know that planets that were used to make this plot were, were high priority, but on the night we will have usually a fairly large list of events and then it kind of it kind of depends on whether, like we might observe them, get a few images and we'll look at the images and we can sometimes tell whether or not we'll be able to resolve the lens star. Um, and then, yeah. So it means being flexible on the night, on the mountain as well. Right, so you decide on the spot, which is quite, uh, quite cool. So you must have a well, long list of spare events uh, because you don't know which ones. And yeah. How much you need per event. Sorry. How much observing time you 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 need to invest per event? Um, almost an hour, I would uh, say. 
-hmm. So yeah, for, for the telescope to, yeah, for the telescope to move and the laser guide star to lock on. Um, and then we have to, yeah, we do 30 seconds per target roughly, and then we do it in five dither positions. Um, so yeah, an hour, maybe a bit more. Right, but then you're uh, stacking the images uh, immediately so to see whether it's uh, it's been successful or not, right? Yeah, well, maybe not immediately, but definitely afterwards, after a week or two. Okay, so this uh, is yeah. from the very short image already, from this 30 seconds exposure, you can yeah. tell. Yeah, you can, yeah. Um, for some events, for others, not so much, and we just uh, we just kind of hope. But sometimes, I mean, we got Keck time in 2018. Uh, I think twice, maybe in 2019. We also got Keck time in 2020. So, for some of our events, we reobserved them over different over those different epochs, um, which meant that um, we could see the progress of the lens if we hadn't seen anything in 2018 or like with Joshua Blackman's paper on the white dwarf they saw that they couldn't actually see anything over those different epochs that they took data which uh, came they came, which made them come to the conclusion that the lens is dark right of course these are probably the most interesting for some and that <laughs> and uh, as uh, Paper shows you can also do that uh, with cash, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely capable. Yeah. Right. Very good. Uh, any more questions, comments from the audience here or Zoom? I don't see any. So let's thank our speaker again. Thank you, Katie, and I'll stop. Thank you very much. Here. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>